Hi, I'm Tim and this is part 3 of the course on building products with JavaScript. And today I want to talk about JavaScript tooling and preparing a skeleton for the backend application. Uh, before we start, I just want to give you a short outline. So basically I will talk about what is Babel.js and how you set it up, what is ESLint and how you set it up and how it can help you during the development, um, how to set up the basic Express.js application, how to test it using tape and uh, super test. And as well, we'll talk a bit about what is test-driven development and how exactly it can uh, drive you to, to better software, but why it can be complicated. And before we start, I want to address a question that's been asked uh, several times on Reddit and in chat and uh, some people emailed, emailed it to me. Uh, so the question is this, why are you going to talk about Express.js, a small library, but not a large framework like Meteor, Sales, or MeanStacking, or any other out there? Uh, the explanation is pretty simple. Uh, number one, I just like small frameworks uh, or small libraries, let's put it this way. Um, and number two, actually, if you want to learn something, you don't take the biggest thing out there. It's actually very hard to dissect it into small parts and teach someone how to use it because it has, it's, it, you know, it's not just a library that allows you to do one thing, it's, rather it's a framework that gives you tools to do everything. And if you want to teach how to use it properly, you have to, uh, to explain about each one of those tools and the practices that ties them together. And, you know, I don't have too much experience with Meteor or Sales, so I don't actually know what best practices are in there and what they use and, and how exactly it works. I may have like a, a basic understanding of it. So it would be really hard for me to teach. And I'm pretty sure that it will be very hard for you to understand how exactly it works, you know, all the underlying stuff. On contrary, if you take something like Express.js, it's very easy to understand how it works because it's a tiny library that is effectively, in case of uh, Express.js, just a wrapper around the Node HTTP server API. And this is really good because you can just go ahead, open the source code and have a look at uh, how it works underneath and know what happened and why you have those errors. While if something goes south during your development in Meteor, you will basically have to dissect half of a framework to figure out what's wrong and you know if it's a bug in a framework or if it's a problem with your code. So it's uh, in my opinion it's easier to teach people when you show them simpler things and in general I just like simpler things. So now that we've talked about that let's go to the interesting part. So I've as you can see here I already have uh, prepared some files here uh, in fact there's actually a bunch of commits so if we open uh, git plus log here You'll see that um, I've created a bunch of comments since the last time. I have not pushed them yet, but by the time you see this video, they should be online in the repository. Feel free to pull it and uh, see for yourself. So the idea is that I will not type code live, but I will just show you the diffs for those uh, comments and, and talk you through them. Okay, so let's start with Babel. Um, Babel is a um, tooling basically for JavaScript that allows you to write uh, versions of JavaScript that are not yet out and compile them to the current version of JavaScript. So if you don't know, JavaScript, which is officially called ECMAScript, is now a living standard. So they actually have a bunch of features that are in different stages of um, clarification, let's put it this way. Yeah? And there's a committee that decides, you now this stage is good or not, uh, what do we, how do we tweak it? How do we proceed? What features do we add? And how do we add them in a way so that we don't break all the code that's been existing on the web until now? Because the rule do not break the web is the most important one for JavaScript. That's why we have a lot of uh, legacy things that don't really make sense sometimes. So Babel allows you to take all of those uh, new cool features and use them today. Um, since Babel 6, uh, which is the most recent version, you have to set it up in a bit trickier manner than before. So before, uh, I think version 5 uh, was, and prior to 5 actually, they all was con uh, configuration less version, so you could just install it and use it right away. But since Babel 6, you actually have to install presets or rules that you want to use, which defines what version of uh, JavaScript next you want to use. You know, stage 1, stage 0, stage 4. If you're interested about stages, I'll put the link in the description. Uh, from um, one of the um, committee guys, I think. Uh, he does a pretty well explanation of what the stages are and how you uh, distinguish between them. But basically, we're going to use uh, stage zero, which is a proposal stage, which means that uh, if 
things go really wrong, they can basically change the whole syntax. That happens several times, but you know, not very majorly because, uh, again, do not break the web. So most of those rules are very, very strict and do not change much. So what do you need to do to set up Babel? Well, in this case, uh, we need, uh, and I already see a typo here, which is a good thing to fix later on. Uh, you need Babel core, you need, uh, and presets, as I said, yeah. So uh, as you can see here, I added them as the dev dependencies to package JSON. And if we have a look here at the, uh, no, that's not what I want. Let's put it over here. So if we look here at the uh, package JSON, you will see that I have them here as uh, Babel uh, dependencies, as dev dependencies. So there are two ways to do that. Of course, you can always just, you know, open JSON and edit it yourself, which is probably the most annoying thing you can come up with. In case you don't know, there is a, a hefty command npm install minus minus save dev, and then you just say, I want Babel core. And once you hit enter, it will automatically install the latest version available of Babel core and then save it with exact installed version into the package JSON. So uh, basically in this manner, you can install all the dev dependencies that I'm showing here. So let's uh, close the package JSON. We don't need it for now. So we installed the Babel core and we installed the ES2015 node preset. Is basically since Node.js is way ahead of the browsers in terms of support for ES2015, uh, you don't need that many uh, rules to support the full syntax. So it's much faster actually for Babel. And then added stage zero, which adds all the current uh, proposals from all the stages, including stage zero, which is the uh, Stroman proposals. Uh, it uh, adds some cool things like uh, bindings and do syntax, which is pretty awesome. But, you know, you can investigate it yourself. I'll put a link to the Babel website. They have a good description of what the rules are and, and what exactly they give you. It's always a good idea to learn ES uh, 2015 uh, because there is a whole lot of really cool syntax there that can save you a lot of time. Okay, so we added that, but that's not enough. So you have to actually configure Babel. And that's, you know, one of the pain points that people have been complaining since they uh, switched to this configuration in Babel 6. To do that, there's two ways. One, you can create .babelrc config, which uh, sometimes doesn't work very well when you publish packages. I've read a few bugs that uh, basically some Babel loaders, um, when reading the packages from node, node modules folder, can pick up the, um, actually the babelrc files from those modules and then break the builds. So we don't want that. We want it to be nice and play nice with everyone. So what we're going to do is we're going to add that, uh, let's close this one, we don't need it, uh, that's a bit too many panels, there we go. We're going to add that uh, config to the uh, package JSON. You can do that now, so if we switch to package JSON, I can, uh, let's close this one, I can show you this, the Babel config, it looks very straightforward, you just say I want presets, uh, in our case, you know, it's limited to presets, but in the same way you can say I want a specific rules here. And we want the ES2015 node preset and stage zero, exactly those ones that I've added here before. Done. After that, uh, basically you can use Babel in either require hooks or from the start script. So if I would say uh, start script, then I could just say uh, Babel um, node, right? And then say that I want to run SRC on index.js, right? But is, this is basically equivalent to what I did in the index.js, as you can see here. So that's what I prefer to do. Uh, this is only works for development, so you should not use Babel require hook in production. It's way easier and better to pre-compile everything. But for development, that works perfect, perfectly fine. So you just require Babel core register, this uh, require hook. Basically, it will plug in Babel in anything you require afterwards. And then you require your source folder, which is, if we see here, it's already written in ES6 with import statements, uh, arrow functions, and whatever. I think arrow functions are actually supported in Node already, but you know, you get the idea. Template literals and all that kind of stuff. So all the fancy things. Okay, so we got that. Um, we added Babel. Next thing is ESLint. So if you don't know what ESLint is, it's a very handy tool that helps you make less errors. Um, so let's actually kill that panel for now and I will show you how exactly it works. So the idea is that there's a lot of common cases when uh, you as a human being can basically screw up writing code. Uh, for example, if I, um, I don't know, if I mistype the variable, yeah, so let's say I type the variable 
localhost address, so let's call it address. And it's going to be a literal that will consist of host and uh, port, right? Because this is how the address looks. So let's add HTTP here. There we go. So this is the address now. Number one, as you can see here, uh, ESLint tells me address is never used. So it's basically a waste of space. Uh, but that's not the only thing. So basically, if I change here to address, but say I mistyped it and typed it with one S, it will tell me, hey, look, address is not defined. You actually, you mistyped it, you know, you screwed up somewhere. So it's really good. Uh, but it's not only that, there's a whole lot more of uh, cases where it can help you. For example, like comparison with double and triple equals. Uh, for example, I, I enforce comparing with triple equals all the time because you know if you compare with double equals like this will be true but i don't want that i want strict comparison and uh so if we do that you will actually see that the um okay no constant condition that's a different error but uh let's say address yeah so we compare address to one and you can see here it expects triple equals so if i fix it it will actually all the errors will go away this is all done by the Atom Linter plugin, by the way. But um, if you want to, you can also run it from the command line. So let's let's undo all of those changes because we don't need them. Um, there we go. I don't need that anymore. Okay. So um, installing ESLint is really straightforward. Let's just go. Hey, no, that's not what I wanted. Let's go over here. So the uh, Installing is done in two steps. Uh, step number one, you install ESLint itself. Plus, you need to specify the config and plugins that you use. In this case, I um, rely, so you, I created this ESLint RC file, uh, which, let's drag it over here, we don't need that anymore, which, as you can see here, is based on the Airbnb JavaScript config. I think this is like one of the best configs I've seen, and it fits almost perfectly to what I used to write. Uh, and so I just extended and changed some rules a bit. Uh, then I say that I want to use a specific parser, babylas lint, which will actually give me way to parse ES6 code with all the new fancy syntaxes. And then I change some rules. So like, you know, the curly braces spacing for object, function names, uh, spaces before function parent and maximum string length. So I just adjust those a bit. And um, after that, I've used the uh, ESLint in a test. So as you can see here, it's ESLint's source. And if we go here, so I think right now it will actually run the whole um, test suite as well. So what we're gonna do now, let's close that. What we're gonna do now here is say, uh, create a new rule called ESLint and say ESLint source, right? So now once we go to the terminal, I can do npm run eslint and you will actually see uh, an error because I'm, not, I'm in the wrong folder, obviously. Okay, let's jump in the server and then do npm run eslint. There we go. Now it's auto completed. So we can see eslint, there are no errors. But once again, if I go say to index and say, hey, here's a unused variable, we just leave it like this. Uh, yeah, obviously now. Right, and if I run it, I will actually see an error here saying me, hey, there's a new var, uh, it's defined and never used. So you actually can see all those errors and it's a good idea to put it into the NPM test. It's exactly what I did over here. Maybe we don't need that actually. Um, which is exactly what I did here. I first run ESLint and then run the uh, test suite, but uh, we can take a look at that a bit later. All right, so we set up the ESLint. Uh, next thing we need to do is to start actually doing the server. So uh, installing the Express.js, let's do it this way. It's a bit easier. All right, so uh, Express.js installation is straightforward. I mean, really the only package we need is Express, at, at least at the very basic uh, version. So, um, you know what, that's not very nice. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go here clear the terminal and check out this commit so that we can actually have a, a look at the uh, specific, okay, I, there's a bunch of files that we don't need, but whatever, I don't care about that right now. So I, we can actually have a look at what I did. So, all right, so as you can see here, I've added Express as a direct dependency and I've 
started writing things in my uh, index file. Uh, in this case, we have a bunch of errors from ESLint about the console statement, which should not be used. But you know, since this is sort of a basic hello world application, it's fine. So what, what do we do here? We import Express, obviously. We create the Express app. I mean, this is basically the tutorial from the Express JS. Yeah. So the only method is we create here is a test method, which is app get slash, which will send back hello world. And then we catch all the unhandled errors and send them as 500 and send the error as the body text. So we will listen on port 8080 by default. And there's one additional thing that I generally do in my Node projects. Uh, there are two events that Node has since I think version four, or maybe it was IOJS that implemented them first. You have unhandled uncaught exception, which is basically whenever exception is thrown by the code, you will catch it here if nobody else catches it. And you had, uh, have unhandled rejection, which is the same, but for promises. If you have a promise that is unhandled uh, or uncaught, you know, don't have dot .catch or finally or whatever, it will end up here. So you can actually see traces here and figure out, you know, something broke and I didn't catch it. So maybe I have to look at that. So it's a nice thing to add. Okay, so now that we have this, we can basically, I don't have to start here. So what we can do is we can uh, go to the terminal and say node index.js. This will uh, start shard on port 8080. So if we open, uh, say, Safari and go to localhost 8080, we can see our hello world. You know, works nice and well, uh, nothing unexpected. And rest status is not a function. Uh, that's a really good question. What the hell happened here? Why did it, why did this one trigger? Okay, whatever. So, but you know, it works. We get hello world. That's a good thing. There are some errors. So let's continue uh, adding things. Um, so this is very basic hello world, but we basically want something more uh, interesting. So let's do the same thing because I think this git log uh, split panes are not big enough to uh, show them correctly. So we want uh, this commit, do we have a commit hash here? Yes, we do. Let's switch to it. And uh, if we look here now in the app, no, I don't want all of those panes go away. So if we look at the uh, index.js now, I actually split it into a uh, simpler code. So here we just take the uh, express app and listen. So this is starts the server. And then here in the app file, we actually initialize the app. This is done uh, to simplify the testing because during the tests, we don't need to start the server. We only need to test it, right? So we don't care about that. Right, so we did that. Uh, next step would be to actually add tests to make sure everything works. So let's check uh, out this commit and uh, see what we actually install. So in this case, I'll be using super test and tape for testing. Tape is my uh, library of choice because it's again, super simple and doesn't really have any uh, complicated things going for it. Uh, like for example, if you take Mocha or something similar, they usually do a lot of magic that can be really hard to trace down and figure out why the errors are happening or why your tests are failing. Tape, on the other hand, is super dumb. It doesn't really do anything, so it's really easy to figure out what broke. Okay, and super test is uh, basically uh, super, um, what was the name of it? Super agent, this is the request library with some additional uh, tools like, you know, expect status code, expect headers, and uh, basically that's it. So it's like sugar for testing, let's put it this way. Okay, so how does the testing work? Well, in this case, we have our get method, which is the stupidest one, and we have uh, we want to test it. So we need to check that uh, our app, which we import over here, uh, and uh, wrap it into this request, which is super test. We want to get this root file, and we expect it to be uh, 200. And we expect the content type to have text HTML in it. I mean, you can do exact matching here as well, but I think regex is fine. Then once the request is ended, uh, we want to uh, define here an expected body, which is hello world, what we said. We get the actual body from rest text. Then we check that the error is not there. So we basically know error, right? If it's error, then it will drop with the error uh, message. And then we uh, try to compare actual body with expected body and say that, you know, this is should retrieve body. And then we end it. So that's it. It's really 
stupid. Uh, and then basically to run it, I've added here, as you can see, to test. We now have this Babel node test. So all it does, it just takes this and throws it into the Babel node because we use ES6 index. I mean, if you would use ES5, you would, can just do node index, yeah? No node test, right? So if we go to the terminal now and no npm test here, it will run the ESLIN first. We got some warnings because we have uh, console statements. And as you can see here, we get top version 13 gets both OKs, two tests pass, everything is good. So our testing works perfectly fine. And that's exactly what we want. This is the very stupid way to test things, but you know, it works pretty well. And uh, most of the time, that's all you really need. This is the way that I generally write tests. And you know, this is sort of first the functions, then the testing. Uh, there is a different approach which is called um, test-driven development, and this is something I want to show you a bit later. Uh, so, but before that, let's have a look um, at the, uh, no, I already showed you this one. Uh, yeah, let's add some body parsing to Express.js. So the, uh, the thing with Express.js is basically if you uh, use it like we have now with a um, very basic app, you won't be able to get the, no, this is the file I want, right? You won't be able to actually get the request body. So you only will be able to get the query from the URI, but we actually want to do the proper API. So we need to um, send JSON back and forth. So let's check out this commit. There we go. And that should be good. Uh, did it what? Yeah, okay. So it's checked out correctly, good. So to, Parse the body, we actually have to add the middleware, uh, one of the express middlewares, which is called body parser. And as you can see here, it's relatively straightforward. You just install this body parser package as the direct dependency. Then you do body parser use, oh, app use body parser JSON, which will add parsing for application JSON types. And then you can uh, also use uh, URL encode extended true, which will add uh, parsing for application uh, form URL encoded. So this is sort of preparations for the next uh, lesson or next video, because then, you know, we're going to do the JSON and JSON requests and all that kind of stuff. Uh, okay, so we added body parsing. And then another thing is that, you know, now if we run uh, tests over here, we can actually see the ESLint errors because it tells us don't use consoles, which is a good thing because console is non-reliable in terms of deployment. It's really hard to capture output of the console when we deploy to servers and we need some sort of better way of uh, rendering the errors uh, when we deploy the app. All right, so how do we do that? Well, we use loggers. And in this case, uh, we're going to plug in uh, Winston and uh, Morgan. Let's check out the last commit. I believe this is actually the head. Yeah, so we can just check out master here. There we go. Uh, we don't need that anymore. So we uh, came to the instant. So as you can see here, I created the util folder, which will uh, contain our logger. Vincent is a very nice logger that uh, allows to create multiple transports. So in this case, I'll just start it with a console transport, uh, which will have a level separation based on the node environment, uh, environment variable. So for in production, I will only output information. And if we're not in production, I will output anything that is debug. We'll have the colorized output with timestamps with pretty print of JSON and label expert server. And we also add the stream to it, which is the stream for Morgan, which is a special parser for Express. Uh, I will show it to you in a moment. So then we import this logger here uh, in um, app and we uh, insert the Morgan, which basically logs every request that comes into Express.js in a nice format. And we say that, you know, Morgan stream your stuff to our logger uh, so that uh, our logging is sort of consolidated and is in one output in one set of transports. So if we now go here and do npm test, you will actually see that we don't have ESLint errors anymore. Test are still passes. And this is actually the example of logging from Morgan. So as you can see here, there's been a get request to the root, which is exactly what we wanted from the tests with the user agent, non super agent 183, and you know, it's resulted in 200 and works well. So um, 
Also, we use the same logger here in index to say that chart is listening. Uh, that's actually wrong. That's copy paste from my old code. Um, let's fix that. Expert server is listening at. Uh, all right, that's you know bugs everywhere. Copy paste is bad. Kids don't do it. <laughs> so if we actually now do npm start, did I add npm start? I don't think I did. Let's add npm start as well. So. Uh, we say node index.js and that's really all we need to say here. So if we do npm start right now, we'll start a server and you will see here that you know we have a nice log. And if I go ahead and fire up Safari right now, we will see that uh, hello world loaded and there we go, there's our log request. You can see get uh, to the root again with the Mozilla 5.0 Macintosh uh, Gecko version, Safari, blah, blah. So basically my user agent header. So there you go. Works nice and easy. Let's kill it. Uh, and uh, now let's talk about test-driven development. So I showed you the way that uh, you can create tests after you made uh, your, after, after you've written your logic. Yeah, But how does the test-driven development work? You probably already heard about it. So the idea of test-driven development is really simple, actually. You just go here and you start with test. Instead of writing your logic, you say, okay, I want to test um, post to, say, login, right? So I want to test my login. There we go. What do I want? I want to have requests app, which should be post uh, login. So this should post something to log, uh, root login. And then send username test password one two three that, that's the wrong bracket. I should expect two hundred. Uh, expect content type uh, let's say JSON. And then when it ends, we got error result. So new line here. Um, so basically expect expected body should be uh, JSON, uh, which say, okay, we got username test, let's do it this way, and then ID one. So basically we say we expect to return the user ID along with the username, so some sort of user info, right? And then we get actual body, which will be response body, which is the automatically parsed JSON body by the super agent. So then we basically check, so uh, no, that's not what I want. Uh, error is no error. And then we do deep equal here because we uh, compare objects. So we actually uh, want to compare them deeply. Otherwise they won't be equal uh, ever. So retrieve user and then we end it, right? So you first write this test because you know exactly what you want from that logic. And basically, if we now go to the hyper term and we, uh, okay, test, ah, test executed. Good, obviously it will fail. So we will tell, okay, there is actually an error and server return 500 internal error because there is no such root, which makes sense. But once you've written this test and you know exactly what you want from it, you can actually go here and say, all right, so login method, um, app post slash, uh, no, we want slash login, right? Request response, there we go. So if request body, uh, yeah, we actually, basically we want to say, well, we need a username and password from request body. And if username equals test and password equals one, two, three, I think was it one, two, three? Yes, it was. Then we return, uh, yeah, res send, and we send a JSON which says username and ID one, right? Otherwise res uh, send, uh, no, let's say status for one. So that's what you properly error, incorrect username or password, right? There we go. So this is exactly what we want. Um, it, it complains that we have inconsistent return values, so let's make it consistent. And if we do test now, NPM, let's clear the screen first, npm test. 
uh, it should theoretically pass if I do not screw everywhere. Yep, so there we go, now it works. This is the essence of test-driven development. Um, the benefits of it is that if you know exactly what you want your code to do, for example, if you're writing a small focused library, it can allow you to move incredibly fast and you will have incredibly sta um, stable code. So it's really hard to break anything if your tests are already written. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't have a very specific requirements or your product is continuously evolving, like for example, if you're doing a startup or if you're doing a research and development project where you don't exactly know how it will end up, you know, if you have some moving parts or business logic constantly changes, it might not work because you just, you know, you, you write one test and you implement your business logic and then manager comes or the customer comes and says, uh, yeah, we don't need that. We need something completely different. And you're like, ah, oh, damn it, I have to change it completely. And then you rewrite the test and then you rewrite the logic and it can take quite some time. So I find it better that basically if you don't have the very specific requirements and, and strict understanding of, of your product, it's way easier to do the logic first test later. But if you do have a good set of requirements and you know exactly what you want, for example, the enterprise projects work very well like this, you, you do test-driven development and you move like 10 times faster. Uh, it looks a bit backwards. I mean, it is backwards basically, yeah, but it can save you a ton of time. All right, I think that's about it for this lesson. So I won't commit this test-driven stuff because you know it, that this is not login function, this doesn't really do anything. Uh, it's just to show you how it works. Uh, but yeah, um, this basically concludes today's video. So in the next video, I wanna talk a bit about Docker and databases because we cannot really continue writing our backend uh, since we need to save stuff to database, you know, like users, questions, answers, all that stuff has to be in a database. And before we do that, we have to pick one and since I don't want to mess around with installing database because it's hard, I want to use Docker. So I will explain to you what Docker is right away and then we will use Docker to deploy our node application as well. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.